All right, everyone, we're going to get going in a minute here. Uh, thanks everyone for coming today. Uh, before we get started, I just want to make a, a few announcements. Uh, first off, the Field Museum acknowledges that it resides within the traditional homelands of the three fires in southern Kue, Odawa, and Potawatomi, and recognizes that it's great. Uh, I also want to just uh, let everyone know that after today's seminar, we're going to go to lunch up at the Beast come is welcome to join us we'll just kind of gather up here uh, after the talk and one other announcement is that after when we have the question and answer session we have a microphone that we can bring around and we ask everyone please ask a question phone so that the people on us and okay on to the show here so it's my great pleasure to introduce kevin boyce today kevin's the chair of uh, department of geological sciences at stanford university he earned his BS from Caltech, where he focused on biology and literature, and then his PhD from Harvard, where he worked with Andy Knoll. Following this, he was a National Research Council Associate at the NASA Astrobiology Institute and a professor at the University of Chicago for 10 years, until he was lured away by Stanford, where he's been a professor for the past nine years. He's currently uh, an editor for paleobiology and has received numerous prestigious awards on uh, record being named a MacArthur Fellow in 2013, known co no, I can't talk, more colloquially as Kevin's an extremely broad thinker who's genuinely interested in pretty much all organismal groups, how they function, and what they do. Much of his work has utilized the fossil record to better understand plant physiology and its impact on climate, as well as the roles plants have played in carbon cycling. A personal note, I first met Kevin in 2008 when I auditioned, when I auditioned for grad school at U of C, immediately struck by uh, the depth and range of the questions he was asking in fungi. And I was fortunate enough to work uh, doing a postdoc with him later on. I can say without a doubt that he's one of the best advisors. I'm really thrilled uh, that he's able to join us. Am I loud enough? How they transport water um, and their capacity for gas exchange and then thereby their capacity to do water releases. Um, Flowering plant can move a lot more water. Um, I've, that's something I've worked on for a long time, um, and I'm not going to talk about that. Um, back back into this, um, um, but indirectly, and only because of part of what I just said has kind of increasingly made me uncomfortable. Um, and that's the notion that um, these things have what that would actually mean. Bumps up against the carbon cycle, um, and the carbon cycle in on the long terms is kind of freaking by. Um, it's been known for a long time, like 40 years at this point, uh, that the weathering of rocks like granite um, is a thermostat for the planet. Um, it's, it's Is a sink for carbon dioxide. Um, and this works better the more carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere, the warmer it is. Um, this has been known for a long time. Um, and then they kind of about 30 years ago, 
should have the capacity to weather these rocks um, by bringing CO2 down to soil rather than not just diffusion going on high in the atmosphere and so on. Um, and this is thought to have greatly lowered atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations when these plants came online um, in the mid Paleozoic and the Devonian. So the first trees are kind of in the middle of the Devonian about 370 million years ago, 380. So uh, once that was uh, uh, done, um, there were a number of, it was an easy, once that model was in place, there was a number of things that could be suggested. It was suggested that the earliest land plants, the pre you know, non-vascular land plants already had done this once before. Um, and there's discussion of angiosperms doing it in the Cenozoic, in Cretaceous into the Cenozoic. So this was kind of, once you came up once, people could look for it and kind of point fingers all over the place and see these types of things. Um, to the extent that it gets to the point where just about everything that's happened in Earth history has been blamed on the plants at some point, right? Um, so uh, various mass extinctions or division, Devonian, um, and, and so on, um, have been blamed on this. One that's potentially there at the beginning of the Cambrian as well. Uh, various rises in oxygen, the Cambrian explosion, all of these things, various glaciations, and so on. I once did the kind of the mildly sarcastic experiment of saying, you know, I've never seen anyone blame snowball earth on plants. So I Googled it and sure enough, there is a paper out there blaming snowball earth on plants. Um, so this has happened a lot, right? Um, and then there's also things like increases in marine diversity through time have also been um, tried to link to nutrient runoff from the land and so on. Um, so this gets used in a lot of these contexts and, and my work has been used in some of those contexts and, and some of what I was just saying about flowering plants. And it made me a little uncomfortable um, because how do you know? How do you know what's actually going on and what's true? And it's, it's really easy to breed these things up, but then how do you test it, right? Some of these suggestions are probably mutually exclusive, right? But everyone has their little hermetically sealed press release where they don't have to mention all the other things that have been blamed on plants that would have come before or after. Um, and of course, this extends to other aspects of the terrestrial biota as well, with the fungi and different um, met metabolisms among fungi also coming up in this context as having kind of changed the world. Um, so feeling kind of uncomfortable about this, but knowing it was complicated, I've kind of meanderingly thought about it for a long time. Um, and it's kind of come down to a series of papers with a permutation of, of authors. Um, but I just want to emphasize that this is a very Chicago connected talk. Matt mentioned my Chicago connections. Matt has his own Chicago connections that you might have picked up on. Um, Mike D'Antonio is a former student who will be starting as a postdoc here. Um, and then Danny Barra has no Chicago connections as far as I know. He's now at Brown, he was, he was at Stanford um, earlier. Um, but so we're gonna talk about some of these things, not all of these things, don't worry, um, but um, kind of going through these things. But again, this all links up to the carbon cycle. Um, and this is a carbon cycle as you've seen it since middle school probably, right? Um, and you know the big arrows and so on, and it's easy to get drawn to the big arrows and the big fluxes and so on. And you have all this photosynthesis, 120 gigatons per year, and, and then there's decay and, and all this kind of stuff. And you get drawn to the big fluxes, but you have to rem remember that this is actually, this is a very small reservoir, right? Um, so if you just burn down all the forests, you know, on some basic level from the Earth's perspective, so what? It will grow back, right? If you give it time, it will grow back. So all of these big fluxes, they're tied to relatively small reservoir size, and they're just a little hamster wheel, right? We're very kind of endeared to this hamster wheel because our entire lives are one small increment on that hamster wheel, but it's just a hamster wheel. Um, and if you go over longer time periods, some of the very small fluxes here are the ones that matter, right? Is 0.01, uh, zero, excuse me, 0 0.1 um, gigatons down here and so on. Those are the things that start to matter because that's sedimentation and that's tied to reservoirs of like 70 million tons of carbonate rocks or 15 million gigatons of organic matter and sediments. Um, so this becomes the long-term carbon cycle. Um, and yeah, the short-term carbon cycle is there, but what ultimately ends up mattering is volcanism that comes out of the ground. Volcanism is not even included in here on this carbon version of the carbon cycle. Um, and then whatever comes out of the ground has to come back down. Um, and there's basically two pathways over the longer term of carbonate sediments and organic rich sediments. And then those things can either be eroded and kept at the surface or they can be subducted, end up in the mantle, and then it can come back up through volcanism. Those are the things that matter on the long-term carbon cycle. And we're gonna be talking about examples from both halves of this. Um, and there's um, an important thing that everything I'm gonna talk about hinges upon, which is that you have to maintain mass balance over long time scales with these arrows. All the output to the atmosphere has to come back down and it has to kind of stay in equilibrium. Um, and everything I want to talk about, like we're not doing the complicated modeling. There's a little bit of modeling. It is not complicated. 
Everything I'm going to talk about basically comes down to parlor tricks involving this, right? But parlor tricks can still be important and tell you think about the way the world works, right? So it's simple, but, but it actually does mean something. Okay, so the first example is going to come from the organic sediment side. Um, and this is a paper that Matt led, um, where what we're looking at here is an image that should be familiar to you since it comes from the Field Museum. This is the Carboniferous Forest here. Um, and the Carboniferous is named after the fact that that's where a lot of the coal comes from, right? Um, and so it's been recognized for, for more than a century, right? This is the whole industrial revolution here, that there's a big peak in, glo in the global abundance of coal deposition in the late Paleozoic and the Carboniferous, and then actually continuing on into the Permian, if you look at it globally. Uh, in Europe and North America, it's mostly Carboniferous. Um, and there was a paper a while ago now at this point doing genomics on fungi um, and showing the evolution of metabolisms in the basidiomycetes. And they found that the wood rot fungi appear to have evolved based upon molecular clock studies right after the Carboniferous. Um, so they revived a suggestion that actually goes back several de decades among paleontologists that um, the reason we have this peak in coal production is because the fungi weren't there to digest the wood. Um, and then once they came on, then that's when that peak came crashing down. Right, so this is basically accumulating because there's nothing there to eat it, all that wood. Um, and that basically comes kind of comes back to some basics of the chemistry of these things. If you look at the cell walls of plants, they all have polysaccharides like cellulose. Um, wood and vascular tissue in general has an additional polymer called lignin, which few things can digest biochemically. Um, and one of them are these wood rot fungi. Um, so lignin is thought to be the abundant contributor to coal. And so if you did not have the fungi, that stuff would just kind of accumulate the idea. Okay, but there's a couple of things wrong with that. First of all, the reason we know that lignin is abundant is coal is by on you know, geochemistry that's been done on relatively young coals that are less metamorphosed and so on. And those tend to be from the Cenozoic or Cretaceous. This is looking at the diversity of plant life through time, vascular plants at least. And those young coals are going to come from an utterly different flora from back here in the Carboniferous. Like there's no overlap whatsoever. What is contributing to those coals? Maybe a couple conifers kind of thing. Um, so if you go back to this Carboniferous coals what, that we really care about, that's dominated by plants like these. These are arborescent lycopsids. There are still lycopsids in the world. They're little tiny, scruffy, herbaceous things, but they made the biggest trees around um, if you go back to the Carboniferous in these swamp forests. So the question really should be, well, what are these things made out of? Um, and doing some old work, this is looking at carboniferous fossils, um, just looking at a lycopsid like this here. First of all, even before getting to the chemistry, this is a cobalt of, of this thing. This little silver dollar here in the middle, that's the wood. So a tree this big around might have this much wood in the middle, right? So that tissue is really fine. But what really matters is all the stuff to the outside of that. A straight majority of the biomass in carboniferous coal can be this bark tissue to the outside of this. And then looking at the geochemistry of these, of these things, I'm not going to get into detail here, um, but doing comparisons of the different tissue types, it's clear that this, this tissue that we know is lignified, the chemistry looks nothing at all like these outer tissues, which make up the whole thing. So lignin actually turns out to be a relatively minor component of these forests. Um, so you haven't evolved the wood rot fungi on some level, well, that's not really relevant to what's going into, the, into all these coals. You can take that a step further. Um, by looking at the um, composition of individual coals through the Carboniferous. And there's actually a big turnover in what is going into these coals. Um, so uh, these are successive coal horizons here. And then through most of the late Carboniferous, it's dominated by these like hops and trees. This is the light gray here, but there's a turnover where we lose those and we're dominated by tree ferns now. Tree ferns are dominated by them. So the biochemical inputs are completely turning over and it really makes no difference in this peak. It's just kind of somewhere in the middle there. Uh, another line of evidence, no, Matt was very thorough with this paper, is that um, we already have evidence of wood rot in the oldest wood that comes before the carboniferous. It's there, right? It doesn't go into molecular clock calibration, stuff like that, because we can't identify what the fungus is. But so it's correct that they ignored it in that earlier paper on some level from a phylogenetic perspective. It's not correct to ignore it from an earth system perspective. But so this is calyxalon wood from the Devonian and it's rotted. And yeah, there's fungus in that, right? Um, so it was being rotted. Um, and further, we can say within those carboniferous coals, those peats, um, there's an overrepresentation of roots and so on, things that were in the peat, right, which was anoxic, which were tars decay and so on. There's an underrepresentation of all the shoot materials and leaves that fall on the peat, expose the oxygenic atmosphere and so on. So this is really, this is all about waterlogging. It has nothing to do with, with um, 
you know, plus or minus the fungus, so on. So having said all that, right? Oh, and I guess I should say one more thing, which is just that um, the coal keeps going. It doesn't stop in the Carboniferous. You know, it's subequal up here in the Cretaceous in the Cenozoic, um, just depending on where you are. So if you have an basin that is appropriate for coal accumulation, it will accumulate. It has nothing to do with what's there rotted or not. Right. So all of these lines of evidence are, you know, these are very strong, and I in part bring them up to then kind of pivot to one more line of evidence. And just this isn't facetious; this is equally true. But but what I'm saying really is true. Of uh, there's just no way you could do that. There's too much lignin in the world. Right? Plants are 20, 30 percent lignin. Even if you had lower productivity, which you probably did in the Paleozoic, that's still multiple gigatons, five gigatons of lignin per year. There's like a thousand gigatons of coal total in all of Earth's history, right? And there's a hundred million years of lignin prior to um, uh, the purported evolution of these fungi, right? So there's just, there's no way it could possibly be true. You'd have to have catastrophic fires for which we have no evidence, or you would have sucked all the CO2 out of the sky and we'd be in a snowball earth or something for which we have no evidence, right? So this just, this can't be true. Um, just based, and you could have done this right from the beginning without all those other more kind of granular lines of evidence. This is this is not going to work that way, right? Um, and that gets into like a basic thought experiment um, um, by Berner and Caldera here of just emphasizing what I what I've said about you must maintain mass balance in the carbon cycle over time. So what this is showing is if you just took uh, you know a pre-industrial CO2 versus a higher level of CO2 and had a small imbalance, 25%. Um, if it was 25%. Uh, too much removal of CO2 relative to the input, like volcanism, then you'd end up in snowball earth in a million years, right? Um, and if you had 25% too much CO2 outgassing, like too much volcanism relative to what's being brought down, you'd end up with a run around, run, runaway greenhouse in the Venus and equally destroy the planet. Like the planet, and this has not happened, here we are. So mass balance has been maintained for time. Um, and this is just kind of the way it is. Um, and this is our updating of that um, where, um, we looked at kind of stepped it down to smaller and smaller imbalances. And yeah, once you get down to like a 1% imbalance, you can kick that around for 100 million years or so, um, or you know, tens of millions of years, so that you have a slight imbalance that then gets, in, um, you know, might get overtaken in a different direction later on. And it wouldn't matter so much. But once you're up to like a, even a 25% imbalance, yeah, you're killing the planet if that existed. So when people talk about these events in Earth history and how the evolution of something caused something to the planet, they often go for these big crashing effects, like a huge imbalance, right? No decay of lignin, something like that. And in part, it feels like you kind of have to be big, right? Because you're talking about the whole earth and changing the way it works. But that's actually the, the wrong way to think about it because just time is an amplifier, right? A small change given enough time is a big change. And a big change given enough time is impossible, right? You can have a perturbation, a short-term perturbation, but you cannot permanently change the world in a way that would kind of put this out of whack. Okay, so that's kind of thinking about that. And then we can get into a couple other examples using that, where this is basically coming down to what I said, there has to be mass balance. Whatever comes out of volcanoes has to come back down. And that's just kind of the way it is. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that this is the basis of all of these geochemical models, like burners, car models, and so on, um, and all this kind of understanding of CO2 through time. But it's important to keep in mind that there's kind of a divergence of what people want from these models. What a burner or a beerling or any of those guys, what they're really after is atmospheric CO2 concentration or oxygen concentration in the atmosphere. That's what they care about. But if you're a paleontologist or otherwise interested in Earth history, you might actually care more about these barrows, right, and how big the fluxes actually are, how much weathering is there, because weathering is a source of nutrients um, for your biota and so on, how much of that is actually happening. And so there, you do care about the size of the arrows, right? Here, all they care about is the equilibrium. Um, and here, the, the size of the arrows really does matter. Um, and to see some examples of that, right? So some of the examples on that earlier figure I showed you of things that people have attributed to plants. Here's the rise in marine diversity through time. And this kind of ramp up to a plateau in the Paleozoic. And then this further ramp up that's happened um, since, since the Cretaceous. Both of those have been suggested to be related to the evolution of vascular plants and then the evolution of angiosperms related to the runoff of nutrients from the land surface um, to the oceans as kind of fomenting diversity through more just, you know, more economic activity. That requires a permanent change in silicate weathering. 
That's the source of nutrients like phosphorus. It comes from rocks. Um, and I, as I'm saying, you can't just do that. You can't permanently change that because you're putting the whole system out of whack. So this, this can't really happen, right? Um, and here's uh, the Devonian mass extinction. It's an old kind of flow chart of what they think might have happened. And here, right here, in this kind of end of the decision tree or whatever you call this, um, we have increased nutrient flux. Um, and that leads to eutrophication. And that's the black shales of the Devonian and the extinction and so on. And then they don't even have on here because they don't think they knew about it at the time. But there's also an ice age at the time um, related to the increased uh, potential, increased land deposition and so on. Um, so all of this is predicated on an increased nutrient flux. And like maybe you could do that for a short, short time, one black shell, right? But you have to choose. You can't just do that for the entire Devonian. That's too long. Um, so you really have to think about these things. And this even kind of, you can get this entirely out of the realm of life and paleontology. This is a, a, a fun paper that was out a couple of years ago. This is looking at just the amount of mud through time um, and relating that to chemical weathering and so on. And what they're showing is the amount of mud rock there's very little of it through the Precambrian, and then things go crazy, and so a lot of mud. Um, and this is kind of blowing up that graph, so you can see that it really is kind of changing as the plants are evolving. Um, and they suggested two possible explanations for this. You could have an increased mud production, which would be increased chemical weathering, or you could just have an increase in mud retention on land. Right? Well, I can say that I don't think this would be possible. Right? You cannot permanently increase chemical weathering by a hundredfold or whatever that would be, a thousandfold. Um, it's not really an option. Um, and these same authors had already provided perfectly valid explanations for increased mud retention. The plants also change the way sedimentation works. And the invention of flood pain playing this vascular plant invention, that's capturing the fine sediments up on land, right? So yeah, there's more mud. Um, and so it's going to come down to that. And this is an alternative explanation dealing with clean particles sticking together if there's more organic matter up on land, um, the flocculation of those particles. That's similarly something that would be influenced by the flora on land, but it's all retention, not production. So what would this actually look like in practice? So things have to balance. Whatever comes out of a volcano has to go back down. Uh, what this line is showing here is a feedback between whatever uh, CO2 is in the atmosphere um, and, and how much is being drawn down. And what happens is like, you just follow the line up and whenever you get to the point where you have the same amount of volcanism, that's gonna be dropped down the equilibrium CO2 concentration, right? Um, the, it will, the CO2 will gravitate to wherever things are in balance, right? If you took too much out, um, you would be out of balance and it would actually by necessity have to decline and it would draw you back down and so on, right? So what happens if you add plants to the system? It's not like nothing's gonna change, but what's gonna change is that you're changing the slope of this, right? Because you have a stronger feedback now. Briefly, yeah, you can have way too much weathering going on and the system is gonna be out of, balance, out of balance. You're gonna be drawing down too much CO2, but all that's gonna accomplish is lower you down the slope until you get back into equilibrium. But now you're at a lower CO2 concentration. Right? So once you're back into equilibrium, it's the same amount of CO2. The fluxes haven't changed, except temporarily under these circumstances. Right? So it works perfectly fine for burner in this curve. But if you're a paleontologist and you're thinking about CO2 drawdown, that's drawdown of the equilibrium value. It's not a permanent increase in the drawdown of CO2. If you actually wanted to change those fluxes, you would have to change the inputs. If you want to change the outputs, you have to change the inputs. If you have more volcanism, yeah, you'll end up with a higher equilibrium CO2 concentration and more and more uh, and also uh, greater fluxes out of the system as well. Um, but it has to be that kind of game, right? So then the question becomes, well, how long is this perturbation? How does that work, right? Um, and we can answer that both kind of theoretically and in practice, um, where what this is first showing here is this is a modeling exercise where it just dumped an extra 50% of carbon into the surface system um, just to see what would happen. And the y-axis here is carbonate, uh, carbon isotopic values, because that will be reflected in that. Um, and things go haywire, um, but then it settles down in less than a million years. And the reason it settles down in less than a million years is the residence time of, of carbon in the surface system is about 150,000 years. So at most, a couple cranks of that, you're going to be back to normal. As we can actually see in something like this here, this is the PTM, the young CPC thermal maximum, about 55 million years ago. And it's kind of the real life equivalent of something like this, um, although not quite as much dumped in, I think. Um, but um, there was a large addition of carbon to the system. Things went haywire and they come, come back to normal. And how long does it take? About 100,000 years. 
right? That's how long those kind of perturbations can be expected to last. Uh, we can see this more broadly. This is looking at carbon isotopes um, of carbonate, living carbonates through time. And you can see this more broadly just here of just how variable this is, right? Things are going up and down, but they're kind of then returning to whatever that equilibrium is. This is the rate of change here. And you can just see, see all that noise going on. But the, you know, the, the wavelength of that is short, right? It's not millions and millions and millions of years. It turns back to whatever normal is at the time pretty quick, right? And then we can compare that to uh, some of the lags that have been proposed on that earlier graph that I showed you. So this is the first evolution of land plants or first evidence of land plants. This is the Ordovician glaciation mass extinction separated by 10 or 15 million years. This is the first appearance of lignin versus you know, the end of the Carboniferous. This is the first appearance of trees versus the mass extinctions in the late Carboniferous, and the black shales in the late Carboniferous. And this is the evolution of flowering plants and ectomycorrhizal fungi, which have both been linked to the declines in CO2 in the Cenozoic. These are all separated by millions of years, tens of millions of years in some cases. Similarly, uh, the Carboniferous glacier way over here has been linked to the evolution of vascular plants in Devonia. These, things, these suggestions are kind of like if we said that the evolution of flowering plants caused our current glaciation. No one says that. And there's reasons no one says that because it's just, no, that's too much time. That's not the way the world would work. So none of these suggestions can really work the way they're being proposed, right? There has to be at least some extra layer of complication to think about these things. Um, and so this whole approach of what people are doing is they're seeing an event first appearance of land plant spores, and then they're looking ahead in time to what's the first thing that this thing could have caused, right? They're looking for a potential effect of that. But that's the wrong approach. Looking at, at the biology and scanning ahead to the environment, you almost have to do something exactly opposite of that, of say, here's an environmental change. What could have been going on right then? Not 15 million years earlier, right then. Um, and to illustrate that, we can do like a little crazy little thought experiment on this. Of uh, If you have some lineage that's going to change the world. It appears, it diversifies, and spreads out on the planet. Um, it's going to have some capacity to be fossilized, right? Um, and once you have it fossilized once, then you definitely have to fossilize, but you're really kind of dependent on the first appearance of the fossil record. It's not going to be right at the origin, of course, we've known this forever. Um, but then if we compare this to the environmental impact, once it's abundant, it should have whatever the effect is. And this is real time, right? If there's an isotope excursion, you either see it or you don't. You don't see it five million years later, right? It is, it is when it is. So this is when it is, the environmental change or a glaciation or a mass extinction. Either you see it or you don't. Versus this first appearance, it could actually be later. The cause could come after the effect and it should not come before. If it comes appreciably before the environmental perturbation, you can kind of say, well, that must not be the cause because it's already too early. And this is kind of showing this here where the blue dots, the, the green band here is some kind of perturbation caused by the first appearance of the blue dyes here. And these are just like individual fossils and pulling them out at random, where if, yeah, if you have really good uh, sampling, yeah, they should be, they should go together. Maybe you can catch it showing up beforehand. But then you start worrying about things like, well, do we have the right sediment types to actually capture these fossils? And well, are, are they reasonably present where we're looking? And oh, if we have a fossil and we care about the evolution of roots and we capture a leaf fossil, that doesn't actually help us. Is it the right fossil we need? Um, and you're very likely to end up in a case where the first appearance in the fossil record is gonna come after the effect rather than before. So one example of what that would look at is we can focus on the late Devonian here. Um, and there's uh, black shales and extinction at the end of the Fronian, which is halfway through the late Devonian. And then at the very end of the Devonian, there's a big extinction, turnover leaf dish and all that kind of stuff, and an ice age. These have been linked to the first trees. They could not have been caused by the first trees. It's much too much time. They've been linked to the first real spread of Archaeopteryx forest, the first real abundant forest tree. This is way too early. Uh, and then we get to the first seed plants here. Um, and this is after the Lepifronia. But it's still 5 million years before the Lepifronia. That's still, that's too early, right? Um, and again, you know, it gets even worse when we start thinking about things like the Carboniferous glaciation. But what we can do is focus in on something like this end of onion here and say, well, what plausibly could have been happening right then? And what do we first see in the earliest Carboniferous? Um, and that includes not the first trees, not the first seed plants, but the first big seed plant trees, right? If seed plants are better at getting away from the lowlands up into the mountains with more 
igneous rocks to weather and so on. Yeah, maybe that did have a big effect, right? Whether that happened or not, I don't know, but that's the kind of logic that has to be used of what could plausibly be going on right when the event occurred in a couple of thousand years or so. So this really could have been the cause of the thing that shows up a little bit earlier. Another thing that could come after the effect is other effects, right? Maybe this didn't cause anything at all, but the climate change associated with the glaciation allowed it to spread, and that's why we first see it in the carboniferous. How would I tell those apart? I have no idea, right? Um, but I do know that these other options are just too early. Right? Um, and if anything did it, it would be something like this. Um, and that that kind of logic is, is kind of what's needed. Okay, so getting back to these lists of things, I mean, most of these, uh, some of them are just out. Some of them, you at least need a more nuanced kind of focused on what could be going on for this actually to be true, right? Um, and, you know, that's hopefully progress, right? We can actually worry about some of these things and what could actually plausibly happen and eliminate some of the possibilities that aren't viable. Um, and that it, it is important not to just let the carbon cycle be the domain of those modelers over there. Um, it matters on the Earth's history side and the paleo side and the evolution of life side um, to understand what's going on with these things because they need us as much as we need them, right? They need to calibrate those models anyway. Um, but it's important to understand how those things would actually potentially operate in real time in something like Earth's history. So I would like to give one more example um, of, of, of the real time thing. And this is what gets back to flowering plants and so on. Um, I, I just said you can't change weathering rates permanently, you just can't do that. Um, and yet, uh, that very first slide I showed you, I talked about there being higher productivity potentially with the evolution of flowering plants. Um, and there's lots of things that are kind of consistent with that. The whole world seems to go crazy, the Cretaceous, all the bugs and everything going on, even like fungi and stuff like that. Everything's diversifying, um, you know, Cretaceous and Cenozoic. So it, yeah, it kind of feels like, sure, the world does have more biomass, it is more productive, and it is more in interesting. Problem is that, you know, I have good reason to believe that these things are capable of more photosynthesis, but um, you don't make a plant out of carbon, right? There's a lot of carbon, um, but you also need things like nitrogen, and phosphorus, and various, uh, uh, you know, less, uh, less abundant nutrients that are nonetheless essential. Nitrogen comes from the sky with nitrogen fixation, and there's a lot of nitrogen in the sky, and nitrogen fixation goes back a long time. Phosphorus comes from rocks, right? Lots of nutrients like calcium and stuff like that, they come from rocks. So if we're increasing productivity, that means more phosphorus, right? Is there a way to do that, right? Um, I just kind of said that there shouldn't be a way to permanently change that for 100 million years. So is there a way to reconcile these things, right? Um, and so the first question to ask is, am I really sure that this is high productivity um, and, and, and that more nutrients would be needed? Um, and this is, this is what I just said. Um, and one way to look at that is to look at the uh, nutrient limitation that can change through time as far as with nitrogen fixation. Again, nitrogen fixation goes back billions of years, um, um, cyanobacteria around a real long time. Um, symbiotic nitrogen fixation of uh, organisms on land, it actually turns out to be really young, right? So this, this paper, this might say voice at all, but this is clearly Matt Nelson here. <laughs> I cannot generate those graphs. Um, and what this is showing is various examples of fungi uh, that have metabolisms based on symbiosis with um, an autotroph of some form, a photosynthetic organism of some form, based upon the exchange of nitrogen in one capacity or another. So um, in these lichens, they will have both cyanobacteria that uh, can fix nitrogen, and then they'll also have um, um, potentially eukaryotic algae that don't fix nitrogen. But um, you can look at the lineages that do have cyanobacteria because only prokaryotes are capable of fixing nitrogen um, and get a sense of what fraction of the lichens and which lineages of lichens can fix nytrogen through time. Um, and this is looking at ectomycorrhizae, which are uh, mycorrhizal associations of plants in practice that just conifers and some angiosperms and just some conifers and some angiosperms. Um, and there are other mycorrhizal associations that go all the way back to the early Devonian, at least. They're in the oldest rocks where they could be preserved, and there they are. Uh, those arbuscular mycorrhizae are more kind of focused on the phosphorus end of things. Um, these exomycorrhizal are better at, they don't fix nitrogen, but they're better at scavenging nitrogen in the environment, so more kind of recycling and so on. Um, and looking at these phylogenies here and the colors, it's, you know, it's hard to see, but we'll see a graph that makes it easier in a second. These are really all coming online 
during the Mesozoic and late, and not even early Mesozoic, mid Mesozoic forward from there. Uh, so you can see this here, right? So this is rate of change within these things. Uh, these two red lines are when angiosperms are appearing, right? Um, and then, so this is just these two lineages here, the, the lichens among ascomycetes and then the ectomycorrhizae among pseudomycetes. Um, and these kind of peaks of diversification um, are going on really early, if not before flowering plants evolve. And then this is various other examples of, of nitrogen-based symbioses among the plants and so on. And they're basically absent for the first 200 million years of complex biotas on land. Um, these two that are back here are cycads and, and uh, hornworts. Um, these might actually be much forward in time. This is kind of conservative if they really is there at the moment, um, and so on. Um, and um, here are all the other things changing in the biota, and their insects, and you know, coal, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's really early, and yet it's really late. Right, we have 400 million years. The first half, there's nothing. And in the second 200 million years, there's everything as far as these symbioses um, on nitrogen-based um, symbioses, which suggests that, yeah, actually, productivity is increasing. Um, and if you're adding more nitrogen to the system, there has to be more phosphorus being added to the system too. Presumably, this is a response, right? Um, this is the thing that biology can change. So the phosphorus must be increasing. And then, therefore, you add, um, there's more of a value to nitrogen fixation. But I said, you can't do that. I said, you can't change the weathering permanently. So how do I get out of this situation? I put myself in the imponderable situation of, I need more weathering and I told you there can't be more weathering. Um, so there's a couple options we can consider. One is there's just more recycling and there isn't any more weathering. Um, and things do change over the Mesozoic. It's in the Mesozoic that we get all the big marine monsters and so on. Uh, this is a modern study showing what happened um, with humans killing all the macrofauna in the world and how that limited uh, uh, transport of nutrients and return of nutrients from the oceans and so on. Um, so this is, this is applied to our modern extinctions, um, but you can just think about this in reverse. And you know, this is also transitioning into the Triassic you know, original evolution of those big guys, right? Um, and beach whales and so on and, and seabirds and, and, and so on do return a lot of nutrients toward land and pterosaurs and the, and the Triassic and so on. And the, and the Triassic is where we get all the big um, first evolution of a lot of the Mesozoic reptiles. So that would be a lot of return. Things like Anadromous fish, they don't come until much later. Uh, that's a Cenozoic thing. Um, but it's in the Triassic that we also get the really kind of diversification of abundant, diverse ranges of aquatic insects, right? And that's an even better form of recycling because it doesn't even make it to the ocean, right? They're taking nutrients out of lakes and putting it back up on land because uh, things like midges can be the whole basis of uh, the, the food web within the lake. And then once they mature, they get their water and are returning nutrients to land. Problem with all of this though, is that all of these organisms are gonna have both N and P. They're not gonna change the balance of what's limiting, right? You're, you're supplying both N and P to the system, nitrogen and phosphorus. So they might increase the capacity for productivity on land, but they're not gonna change the demand for nitrogen by adding more phosphorus than they're adding nitrogen. So this actually can't explain anything. It's in interesting and it could be important, but it's not gonna change this balance of limitation between nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, we could get back to volcanism as something that really could change that balance because you add more, wet this really will add more weathering. And sure enough, yeah, volcanism is really high in the Cretaceous. This is the same reason we have the white cliffs of Dover and so on. In the same way, the Carboniferous is named after all the organic matter, Cretaceous, that's Cretaceous, that's chalk, right? That's all the limestone, um, which is a weathering product. Um, so yeah, there should be really high nutrient availability here. But you have to keep in mind that all these evolutions of these symbioses have continued apace through the Cenozoic. And now it's actually as low as it's been as far as volcanism. Um, over the Phanerozoic. These are various alternative models for how volcanism has changed through time. Um, and we can actually plot those evolutionary innovations that we saw in those earlier graphs through time based upon the perceived volcanism of that time from these different models. And, and there's no pattern at all, right? It doesn't matter if volcanism is, is high or low, you can have high or low rates of evolution of these things. It doesn't matter. The one thing that really does come out here is that the open symbols are Mesozoic and Cenozoic and the closed symbols are Paleozoic. And it's just that the Paleozoic is really low. And after that, it's higher, right? So volcanism is not explaining these things. Here's something that actually I think could explain it. 
when we evolved plants, we talked about you know, the roots and the increased capacity for weathering with lower atmosphere CO2. That's not the only thing that plants did. They also added coal to the system. And in the same way that volcanism can make things higher, coal, organic matter deposition, is an alternative shunt away from weathering. So when you evolve plants, when you evolve trees, rather than increasing weathering the way people have always expected, weathering rates and weathering fluxes, they actually would have decreased them because they also added coal to the system. And that is going to, by necessity, pull carbon away from weathering deposition and carbonate deposition. Um, so this is showing the volume flux of organics through, through time. This is just North America. Um, and we can see these things coming online. So this is basically, this is an entire new bucket to the carbon system, right? Um, this organic sediments, there's always marine deposition going back billions of years. Um, but substantial deposition of organic matter on land, that's since the evolution of vascular plants. And this has to take away from this bucket. But it won't do it forever. There's a rock cycle. Rocks are formed and rocks erode. And over the course of a rock cycle, over time, this bucket that was initially empty will fill. Over time, most of the rocks will post-date um, the evolution of these plants and the deposition of coal. And so you'll start eroding as much coal as you were depositing. And then that will no longer be a bucket. Once the bucket is full, it's just going to slosh over and it will no longer be a part of the system um, in that particular way. Um, so to see what this would look like, this is simple modeling. This is just coal barrel rate. There is no coal and then there is, right? This little step function here. What will happen with that is rocks, this is looking at decay time. This is the length of a rock cycle, the half-life of a rock um, in millions of years. So the main arrow here, this is 150 million year rock cycle. If you do that, yeah, there's gonna be a ramp up in how much organic matter is preserved on the continents. But over time, it will plateau because over time, these rocks are also decaying. And after a point, however much coal you're adding, you're also eroding it away. Um, so that no longer is a part of the system. So what will weathering do? Initially, all of this coal deposition will be a big hit on the weathering because you've added in this coal. But over time, as you start eroding that coal, it will return to where it was before. Right? And 150 million years after the Carboniferous, what is that? That's the Cretaceous. Right? So this could actually just be a capacity here of it's not about increasing weathering through time. It's about suppressing weathering for a while and then allowing it to rebound as the continents become kind of full up with, with this kind of source of organic matter. So if we do that more realistically, this is a more realistic time course of, of coal through time, of organic matter through time. So you get a more funkier kind of accumulation curve here. And then you get something like this when you add in volcanism and allowed volcanism here too, whereas up here, volcanism was just uh, a, a flat line. And when you do this, it's a little bit more complicated. And this is also taking account that uh, some weathering is in the marine realm, and that's not actually not going to change through time. That's going to continue apace. So in the late Paleozoic, it's really low, right? Nutrient availability should be really low. Um, and then it's only after the Paleozoic that we get a, this rebounding of, of things um, back to where they were before it. So the very evolution of a complex biota on land that could have supported all these interesting symbioses and so on would have acted to suppress the need for those symbioses by lowering um, the nutrient flux into the system. Um, so there's just not as much need for that nitrogen fixation and symbiotic capacity like that. So the modern world is complicated. This is showing ectomycorrhizae and arbuscular mycorrhizae and nitrogen fixers and their distribution around in this kind of a heat map of high or low um, abundance. Um, and they're all available here. It's not like it's, we're in a world of nitrogen fixtures now. We're in a world of nitrogen fix fixtures at high latitudes, but not in the tropics. Um, where here you have the very heavily weathered uh, uh, soils and very low nutrient availability. So they, they really care much more about phosphorus and so on. Um, so the world's complicated, right? Um, and that's fine. Um, but all we're saying is that um, this, this, what this is showing, this is the equivalent graph to what I showed you before of the evolutionary innovations for 10 million years. Before it was versus volcanism, and there was no pattern to see. Here, this is not versus volcanism, but what we think is going on with weathering, given these changes in coal deposition. The pink line is where we are now as far as the weathering fluxes. And you can see at the pink line, you can do whatever you want. But if you get much below the pink line, you fall off a cliff. And there's very little evolution of those things. And this is the Lake Paleozoic. 
Um, so this really could be a question of what's going on. And so the world is complicated and anything can happen in the modern world, but in part that reflects because we are up here. Um, whereas in the late Paleozoic, we would have been down here um, and there would be just less of an impetus for, for some of these things to evolve. So this is kind of a, you know, a cartoon version of exactly what I just said. Uh, our weathering rates right now might not be any more than the early Paleozoic or pre cambrian um, but what's changed in between is we've added a terrestrial flora that makes coal. That coal is going to detract from that nutrient flux, but it, over time, there's going to be as, um, almost as much or as much um, oxidation of that organic matter it erodes and oxidizes um, as is being buried, and then we will return to where we were um, early in the Paleozoic. So it's not about an increase, absolutely. It's about a suppression and then a release of that suppression. And this is important too, because this means that angiosperms didn't change the world. They're taking advantage of the fact that the world was already changing, right? Um, and of course, angiosperms changed the world. I will rephrase that. Of course, they changed the world. They did many things in many ways, climate, diversity, and how it then feeds into the arthropods and everything else. But they, in this one way, yes, they're the ones that are very productive, but they're not because their productivity changed the world. The world changed, and so they could be more productive. Um, and that, but this change had that was already in place. It wasn't the flowering plants that changed the world. It was basically those tree ferns and lycopsids back in the Carboniferous, and all that burial of things kind of set off a bomb that eventually was going to go off um, as the world recovered from what was going on when these things first evolved back in the Paleozoic. And that is it. Thank you. Uh, have a mic. Oh, sure. uh, so, uh, two messages from what you presented are um, time scales matter. Yes. And on very long time scales, everything has to be in balance. Yes. Okay. So um, we, on, on human time scales, yeah. of course, we have an imbalance because of yeah. the burning of fossil fuels, but you often hear pleas to plant more trees and that sort of thing, yeah. which is such a short-term solution. In fact, the alternative you can also hear is it's better not to plant trees, but to bury trees because then you take <laughs> carbon out of the system. Yeah. So I, I guess I'm just wondering if, if you're... So what, what yeah, you thought yeah, about yeah. gives any advice yeah. on what to do on human time scales in terms of um, maintaining yeah. carbon balance. Yeah, so and we, we are still stuck on that hamster wheel. Right? <laughs> so so there, there is still a point to doing those things. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it's hard for us as humans to think about these things because we do not live in mass balance, right? Um, like if you do the math, it's, you're burning per year, one million years of fossil fuel accumulation, right? So obviously that has to stop, not because, you know, our moral standings, because it has to stop, it just can't continue. Um, but um, yeah, so it, it is true. And it's gonna take, you know, 50, 100,000 years for that stuff to come back down if, you know, if we don't figure out how to pump it down kind of thing. Um, but um, that doesn't mean that, you know, the fact that we're on that hamster wheel, you still wanna slow that hamster wheel down, right? So th th there still is a point, but it's only for our benefit. It has no, you know, long-term impact on things. A lot of this is a stupid question, but what's an Andromeda and Andromeda's fish? And how does that benefit us? Yeah, yeah, I see. I should have just said salmon, right? Yeah. A, 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 a fish that, that goes uh, to the ocean for part of its life cycle and then swims back up on land and dies, right? So, so salmon in the Northwest or in, in Russia and so on, uh, they're actually a really big nutrient source because they're getting big fat in the ocean and then turning and dying. Um, so, they're actually an important source of nutrients. Um, I, but I should have said salmon. <laughs> aren't salmon? Yeah. Or just salmon? Uh, well, the one, the one I, I don't know if all salmon are there or not, but the, the, any, any, it doesn't have to be salmon, either, but any fish that okay. is spawned on land um, and then has part of its life cycle in the ocean and then returns and dies. Um, any of those fish are actually returning a lot of nutrients. Good to know that. Thanks. Any, uh, 
Oh, so we need a, a graph of eels versus salmon through time. Yeah. <laughs> Not gonna get asked about the track. <laughs> Not gonna happen. All right. Okay, so I have uh, three questions for you, and I'll try to keep it really short. First one would be for the cause and effect time scale. Yeah. If we expect that during a major mass extinction event, anoxia plays a big role, uh, we end up forming these based on anoxia, these depositional settings that allow for exceptional preservation. Right, and we learn usually a lot about evolutionary innovations, especially from these exceptional preservation sites that are mostly lagged. So, wouldn't you expect that any kind of evolutionary trigger would manifest, sort of like at the time of the extinction event in these exceptionally preserved sites? Yeah. So, uh, the Devonian is one of the best times for pyrite preservation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, but that would still give you. Simultaneous, it would not give you before, right? Um, and you know, if you get lucky and you find something simultaneous, that's great. But um, I think the real key is that anything that is appreciably before the event probably didn't cause it um, because of, um, the carbon cycle has to be kind of dead on there. But yeah, so if you, yeah, that would be fun if if the black shales gave you better preservation. For, that works for some things, not others. But for plants, yeah, a lot of things is actually in marine pyrites and devonian that's washed offshore. Um, yeah, um, and that, but. Even there, then because because it's a taphonomic window, you also have to keep in mind that anything you see in those could very well have evolved much earlier, right? So you're still left with a, a problematic situation as far as knowing what you're actually seeing. But if you do see it before, it didn't cause it. Very interesting thought. Um, second question. Second question. Uh, to which degree do you think does organic burial chemically represent organic oxidation? Looking at the two arrows, the green arrow and the black arrow in your plot. Okay, say that again. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't quite to follow. which extent does organic burial represent, chemically speaking, organic oxidation? Oh, see, because I met with you <laughs> yesterday, I know where you're going with that. This is incomplete. Yeah, you're talking about incomplete oxidation. I'm talking about complete oxidation. Okay. You, are, you, are not, you are not analyzing CO2 from the atmosphere to find out what was alive in the past. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I reject that question. Third question. Fine. <laughs> Third question, in your blue arrow for the silicate weathering, uh -huh. um, you took into account reverse weathering? I did not, I did not. Um, and so uh -oh. uh, we did a little bit of like the stuff that goes on with um, in the marine realm that I did try to show that, that basalt weathering in the ocean is gonna happen no matter what and so on. The reverse weathering, I mean, that's the, yeah, I know it's a hot funky thing and, and people, but people are arguing so much about it that I don't wanna, I don't wanna touch that, right? Um, I don't wanna go near that. Um, so no, <laughs> that, that, that's, no, I did not look at that. Anyone else? <laughs> I think. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm coming. I'm coming. Yeah. Well, on on that last point, yes, I agree with you. That you know, reverse weathering has become a thing people are interested in. But even if you um, if you uh, accepted the purported important importance, what would be what's the relative yeah, ratio it, it, of I, I don't forward yeah, weathering to reverse weathering as that and I don't know the answer to that. I yeah I agree that with the thrust of that that is not probably not going to make difference, but it's not like I have that answer what those numbers are. So I don't I don't want to yeah. say that. Yeah. Uh, I believe Scott had a question. Um, you showed that nice plot of uh, the delta 13 C of carbonate through time, uh -huh. and it looks like it has. Um, it looks like there's a pretty big dampening of the of uh, peaks and valleys through time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and that's I know that's been attributed to the enhancement of the carbonate um, system in the ocean through the evolution of Coccolis and and uh, other plankton that are that produce calcareous tests. So is that is that a uh, a counterexample to? Um, a, I mean, it, people have have said this is this is uh, basically stabilizing the the system by enhancing the rate at which uh, CO two can be removed from the atmosphere. 
it's definitely yeah, it's definitely buffering the system, and it and it's pretty pretty clear here, right? Like there's nothing necessarily to argue about it or the pattern does come down. Um, and yeah, people have attributed it's over the Fanner's Oak, so it's really easy to attribute it to life um, and and biomineralization and so on. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I see why it would be a counterexample. Well, it's just, it is, uh, you're, in, you're basically increasing the, the flux rate or you're, you're increasing the, uh, the rate at which carbon can be removed from the atmosphere and sequestered in carbonate sediments, right? Yes, so that's, so. That's still in the hamster, right? <laughs> right, so that's stuff that is being, you know, you, you have coccolis sinking. Uh, if they're below the compensation point, they're going to dissolve anyway, right? I, I don't think that that's necessarily going to. But if it ends up in the long, if it ends up in the carbonate sediment box, yeah. So but, and then and then there's subduction. So, uh, so I, in a sense, it's it's what it's doing is it's strengthening the feedback from the short term cycle to the yeah. the ability to move uh, carbon in this case to the long-term yeah, cycle but, from the short-term cycle. And now, and now that I've changed slides, I don't want to get back, but, it, <laughs> but in some ways, I, like it's lowering the amplitudes, but it's not right. changing the lengths. Are, like it's, 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 it is shortening the lengths of perturbation. It's not right. preventing perturbations from existing, and right. it's, not, uh, it's not preventing them from existing. Like it can still be knocked off, the, off that balance and so on. So I, right. I don't think like it necessarily changes. That. Yeah, there's definitely there are more things with skeletons to time, yeah. and that that is kind of part of this. Um, but um, I don't I don't think like necessarily. Um, well, one more quick question, yes. not about the tractor. I know you wanted to ask about the tractor. That's why you put this slide back up. But you, had, you asked me a question that was relevant to the slide. Yeah, the, the, this one is also I think relevant, which is, um, do you have you looked at the any potential effect of um, continental position through time, since there's a should be a pretty strong dependency of the amount of continental area that's in the tropics as opposed to at high latitude, because weathering again, that would that yeah. Would... So um, uh, well, so that can come on on both sides, right? As far as the weathering flux and all that and so on, uh, it might change the equilibrium. It's not going to change the flux, right? It's, it's going to lower atmospheric CO two equilibrium. But you know, if there's less CO2, then all those continents are going to be exposed to less CO2, and, and so the fluxes aren't going to change. The other place that's relevant is actually um, that I think is the answer for the coal story of you had you were forming Pangaea. There was lots of tropical basins that were wet um, at a time when the tropics were wet, and so you got a lot of organic matter deposition because of it. Um, so I think it does matter as those things change through time, um, and it can matter if what you care about is CO2. Like so, people make the same arguments for, um, you know, and this is more viable argument for snowball earth of, of there's a large of these problems placed in the tropics at that time when, um, and the thought is that the extra weathering kind of tipped things far enough that, you know, you got a runaway effect. Um, and, but again, that's not going to change the fluxes overall once you're out of that perturbation, but it can, it, yeah, it's going to change CO2 concentration. Yeah, no, if it's changing the weather flux, it's going to change phosphorus, absolutely, yeah. Um, but those fluxes, Post perturbation aren't going to be any different than what they were, right? Just the same. I think we've got one online, real quick, and then next, next, you're next. If that's cool. All right, thanks. Okay, so question from Roy Plotnick: uh, Macro strat data shows a major transition from carbonates to plastics in sedimentary rocks after the Paleozoic. Do we have any data on how much erosion of coal beds is occurring over time as they are exposed? Uh, I don't, and yes, that's actually, uh, hi, Roy. Uh, that's, a, that's a very important uh, question um, of, with this modeling, the one kind of, if I, I was trying to keep it as simple as possible. Um, the one thing I would want to add is, is that kind of concern of what we have is the modern record of coals. We're not, don't have a direct record of what was lost since then, right? Um, over time, right? And how much coal there would have been how much carboniferous coal there would have been if we were looking from the Permian and so on, right? Because that's really the optimal question of, of what those changes actually were. So you know, that's a very important question. And I wish I had the answer to that. We could probably do some kind of inverse modeling of how much you would expect to have lost and see how much, how reasonable or not it would look. Um, that would be kind of the next thing that would have to be done though. Um, I, I don't know of any existing data set that actually 
you know, provide that answer though. Hey, Kevin, I'm, I'm going to ask you a non paleobotany question in this okay. sense. Um, can you take these thoughts and move from our planet to maybe potential, potential for life on the solar system, right? You've, you basically described a system that can only waffle between 1% or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how much does that reduce the likelihood that we'll find life if, if it requires this kind of a system? Um, so, I mean, the things that are required by all of this stuff is CO2 in the atmosphere, water, our interaction, reactions are all aqueous and so on. I don't think it limits things any more than a lot of other things already do, right? Um, we're already kind of expecting life to be aqueous and so on. Um, the, it's definitely like, so like with Snowball Earth, right? We didn't have to come out of that, right? That required the existence of plate tectonics and so on, right? So it, it does provide some constraints of like why Mars might've done what it did versus us and so on. Um, so, but I think we already had some of those things, right? Cause, cause Mars would not have been able to come out of a Snowball Earth because there's no, you know, they had lost the volcanism, but that's also a reason that they're not recycling their crust and getting nutrients recycled. Like, so there's lots of reasons that kind of add up in the same way. Um, I don't know if it uh, eliminates any boxes that wouldn't have been eliminated already, I guess is, is the way to think about that. Um, but um, yeah, it's certainly, you know, another way that some of those same parameters were developed. I think it's an unsatisfying answer, but I think it's the, the correct answer probably. <laughs> All right, thanks very much, Kevin. Uh, I wanna just make a few quick announcements. Uh, first off, I wanna thank uh, Emily Halleck, Jingmei O'Connor, Sarah, Sarah Ruan, Stacey Drake, and Abigail Derby Lewis for all their work uh, coordinating this seminar series over the year. This, this has been really a, a lot of work on all of, all of their ends, especially Emily. Um, so th thanks so much for that. I also wanna say we're going to lunch after this, so feel free to join us. And then finally, thanks a lot to Kevin. This was really wonderful. I really appreciate you coming out, thanks. Thank you.